Buna Deminata. It's great to be here. I practice all morning. Thank you, thank you. Okay. It's uh, the AI that taught me this. No, just kidding. So I'm here to speak about the good future. You know, these days it's really interesting to see that many people around me saying the good future doesn't exist, including my own children. When I speak about the good future, they say, haven't you noticed COVID, climate crisis, war, uh, all the problems that we're having? And so last year I set out to make a film about the good future. Uh, you may notice this, this is Lanzarote Island in Canary Islands. And the film is about how we can actually make a good future that is better than what we have today. So I want to explain how that would work and what it has to do with everything that we're looking at today, including this. E.O. Wilson, the famous biologist, he says the real problem of humanity is the following. We have Paleolithic Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions, government, and godlike technology. It's funny, you know, that we can safely say, I think we have improved our emotions a little bit. Uh, we're working on the government, right? But godlike technology, technology is just exploding in innovation. Look at all of these things that are happening around us. Uh, information technology, biotechnology, synthetic technology, energy, climate tech. In the next 10 years, we're going to completely reinvent how energy works. Battery technology, solar technology, nuclear technology, everything. In 10 years, we'll be able to supply enough energy without fossil fuels. The biggest deal today is artificial intelligence, machines that can not think, that can learn and understand. And I think really what's happening is with all of these things, it could be heaven or it could be hell. And it has nothing to do with technology. All technology can be hell. You can take a hammer, build a house, or you can go kill the neighbor. You can take artificial intelligence and fix climate change, or you can make a super soldier. Technology is morally neutral until we use it. It's up to us to use it correctly. This, of course, is the biggest challenge today, because technology is so powerful, so tempting, right? and makes people so rich. Did you know that Facebook makes $150 million profit every single day? Did you also know that Facebook is single-handedly the biggest negative force on democracy in the world? Okay. Why is that? Because you see bad news six to eight times as much as good news, and it's an algorithm that does it. Okay. So we're going to this future where we see all these things happening at the same time. Six very big game changes. And again, I think that's extremely hopeful. We're going to solve every practical problem. Artificial intelligence, quantum computing, machines that can supercompute, nuclear fusion is being invented, the opposite of fission. 15 years from now, roughly, unlimited energy. I always say as a joke, Spotify for energy. Uh, you see a, a synthetic uh, biology being able to create new materials. You see all kinds of things in genetic engineering and, of course, geoengineering to fix the earth to get green again. That could be amazing. And think about all the new jobs. I mean, if you're worried about your job, there's plenty of jobs here. Plenty. Just climate change alone, the prediction is 100 million new jobs in 20 years. But in a way, you could say, you know, we're becoming as God. You know, I, I don't necessarily believe in God, but, but we have God-like powers now. With my mobile phone, very soon, again, with the Apple Vision, you know, I can see the world like you know, Minority Report. I can take the blue pill, the black pill, and I can go off and live somewhere else. Kevin Kelly, famous futurist, said, we should be optimistic, not because our problems are less than we thought, but because our capacity to solve them is larger. And that is just so true. Let's stop looking at the things that we can solve, you know, larger things. Let's look at the things that we are solving. It's mind-boggling what's happening there if we think positively. Your mindset contains the future. And this picture shows technology can be a present, a gift, a solution, amazing, or can be a bomb. 
The mobile phone helps us to communicate, but these days, more people have more relationships with their screen than they have with people. We gotta think about what we are and what we want from the world. So I really believe that the good future depends on this. And the good future isn't just about a great job, making more money, progress, growth, right? It's about four things, people, planet, purpose, and prosperity. I like prosperity better than profit. And this is shaping up all around us. It's people your age, I can just tell by looking at you, roughly between 25 and 45, that are currently changing the agenda for my generation. You know what our agenda was? You know, more growth, more profit, doing well, working. The new agenda is this, and you can see this happening everywhere, and that is the challenge. We need what's called in Greek, tell us, wisdom. We don't need to just say, well, our artificial intelligence is bad, social media is bad, everything is bad, I just hide somewhere in the mountains. No, we need wisdom, balance, purpose. That's what we're looking for. Remember, technology is not what we seek, it's how we seek. If we confuse the tool with the purpose, we are in deep trouble. It doesn't matter if you're Elon Musk and you can go to Mars, you know, when things are not working here. But for us, you know, if you have kids or you're going to have kids, you got to think about that. So, what's happening right now is humans and machines are converging. AI, human intelligence, and AI, machine intelligence. Students are using ChatGPT to answer questions, to fill out exams. We're able to talk to computers. In a few years, it'll be perfect communication in every mainstream language, not in Swiss German or maybe other languages like this, but in pretty much any other. We'll have an oracle in our pocket, and you won't have a mobile phone. You just tap somewhere and say, hey, I need a date, get me a date. Well, something like that. Or you have a virtual reality helmet that people can't see. I mean, it's mind-boggling, but also very scary, because think about how we would get addicted, literally. You could net not get out of bed without putting your device on. Well, that's kind of like that now with a mobile phone, right? But the mobile phone, you know, we can still do without it. So artificial intelligence is about turning information and data into knowledge. That's from Demis Hassab, is the guy from DeepMind, who did the Go game some time ago, works for Google now. Information and data into knowledge. Think about that for a second. Isn't that what your job is all about? Knowledge? Well, I have news for you. It's not really about that. Of course, knowledge is always good. Stuart Russell, the UC Berkeley professor, says, intelligence means having the power to shape the world to your interest. This is why humans rule the world. We are more intelligent than monkeys, some of us. And if we have an artificial intelligence with an IQ of a billion, even if they don't feel or are conscious, you know, that, that could be kind of a problem for us uh, because, you know, they become more intelligent. So if we look at this, what's happening now is that machines are starting to understand. And the founder of OpenAI, Sam Altman, the CEO, says the coming change is about this, the human ability for machines to think, create, understand, and reason. Think about that for a second. Do you want a machine that thinks, understands, creates, and reasons? I want a machine that gets the job done. You know, a better Google Maps, a better email app, a better scheduling app, a better driver, a better whatever. I do not want a machine to be generally intelligent. That's my job. That's the human job. So very, very big question as to what we want and who is in charge and how are we going to use it? So here's a short clip of Bill Gates talking to Socrates. It's a machine that can learn and reason built wow. upon vast amounts of data and complex algorithms. It imitates human thought processes to provide tailored learning experiences. I sense a shadow over this marvel, a hidden danger lurking within. Uh -huh. Dear Bill, as you know, I am a proponent of self-examination and seeking wisdom. That's true. Tell me, what might we gain from this new form of intelligence you have created? Oh, you don't know. You can watch this on YouTube. But AI did this, of course. Right? 
was made by a machine. And now we have people making machines that look like humans. You know, the Samsung Neon, the replica, which replicates dead people so you can talk to them after they die. Okay? Uh, and, of course, all of the generative AI that we have out there. The question is, it's, you know, it's cool, it's interesting, but what will it do, for example, for work? The green box is potential for automation. Right? So office work, sales and related business, financial operations, many of us do that, architecture, engineering, and legal, 33% right? high potential for automation, and even higher potential for augmentation, you know, adding things to us. Here's the news. The machines aren't coming anymore to the factory workers. <laughs> They're still coming for those. They're coming to the knowledge worker. That's us. Right? And that is good news. Because if I can automate parts of my routine, I can do other parts that the machines can't do. If I can augment myself, I can be more powerful. But, of course, many companies will have a temptation to say, if GERD can be four times as fast, I fire the other four poor pe people, right? I get rid of them. And so we have many things to think about when we think about this, about routine, what's happening, because that is really what's happening. The machines aren't coming for our work. They're not coming for us. They're not coming to harvest our bodies for energy. Right? They're coming for our routine, for the monkey work, the simple work, the commodity work, the brainless work that we all do in some way. That can be both good or bad, but look at this chart saying basically four and a half times as much efficiency in paralegals, office support, and so on. The key question we have to ask ourselves and the government, if this is happening, who will take care of the benefits? If there's more money being made, who gets the money? And the answer right now is the people that built the system. <laughs> they get the money. It's not the workers. I mean, basically, uh, productivity goes up, wage goes down. Yeah. That we have to fix. This is a question, of course, of the right policy. So this is what's happening with our work. The bots are coming. They're not going to take our work. They're going to take our routines. And our job is to go up in this pyramid. The pyramid of work, like Maslow, right? the lower part of this pyramid is about stuff that machines can do. I call it machine turf. Data, information, simple, stupid, binary machine logic. Like Google Maps. Like Google Maps is, yeah, it's logical, right? It's not feeling anything about the route that you're taking. Our job is deeper knowledge, tacit knowledge, understanding, wisdom. This is what we have to focus on to have work in the future. This is what you have to tell your kids. This is what you have to teach them in school. Wisdom, purpose, consciousness, art, understanding. That is what makes us human. We are not going to last, in less than 10 years, machines will have more logic than all of us combined. But logic alone is not enough. You know, logic, in fact, is about 3% of real life. Everything else what we make is illogical, inefficient, unclear, unstructured, not binary. So that's our human-only turf. That's the future of our work. And that makes me positive because in 10 years, maybe we don't have to work that much at all because the machines are doing most of the hard work. We have to have the right policy for this. Right? Huge debate on this, especially in France right now. But we can see what's happening now. Billions of dollars are going into artificial intelligence research, and very little money is going to what's called alignment, right, down here, to align what's going on with human things. That needs to change, because we have this issue. If it's just going to be about money, then who's in control? Who takes care of our rights, apart from the, maybe the European Commission? Who cares about the truth? Machines don't care about truth. They know nothing about the truth. They don't know our feelings, our values, our emotions, our meaning, nothing. They know data. They look at your face and say, oh, you're angry. They have no idea what angry is, what a face is, what it means to exist. <laughs> They're just looking at data. So that's something we have to be very careful with. And the key question is if technology can be good or bad, if technology has no ethics, who does? 
Will you have the ethics in your work to stand up and say, no, we shouldn't be doing this, it's not good for people? Will you say, we're not going to launch this product because the side effects are huge, like OpenAI and ChatGPT? Will you have a human agenda? We need to invest equally in humanity than we invest in technology. That is our countries, our government, our schools, not just STEM, you know, science, but also HECI, humanity, ethics, creativity, and of course our companies. We have all of these people asking now to stop investing in AI only and think about what we're doing here. I signed these letters not because I'm against AI. I'm not. I think it's a fabulous tool. I enjoy using it. But to create a framework, you know, what is good use? What is not? Would artificial intelligence, automation, augmented intelligence, that sounds all good, but autonomous intelligence? That's like saying, OK, uh, I'm going to build a machine with an IQ of a billion, but I hope it will not step on me by accident. It wouldn't care. If you told the machine to solve climate change, you know what it would say? Eliminate all humans. It's the most logical solution. A bit of an inconvenience for us. but So who will be mission control for humanity? Is it the companies that make this stuff? because they're going to make trillions? Is it the stock markets? Is it our governments? And so one thing that we're going to need, I call this the International Artificial Intelligence Agency, the IAAA, like the nuclear agency, to think about how we're all going to agree on what we're going to do here. And this is already in the making. It's coming up everywhere. Because now we're at the time where we're switching from this whole conversation about if something is possible, the answer is, Everything is becoming possible, right? But why? And who? Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, said the other day, technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It doesn't want anything. To which I would add, the want is up to us. Really, really crucial to have the right one. I want technology companies to make a pledge. I call this the technocratic oath, like a doctor. I will not do things with my power that will harm humans. I will pledge to do the right thing to humanity, regardless of temptation of money. Right now, artificial intelligence is in a gold rush. A rush towards more money, more power, more military, I'm sure, as well. We need to change our thinking from this single track, profit and growth, to the four tracks. We need to put the human back in sight. We should always have the humans in the loop with all technology, even if it takes longer, even if it's inefficient. That is the nature of humanity, right? And we have to find a balance between proaction and precaution. That, I think, is the ticket to the good future, is to find that balance, to think about our intelligence and the machine intelligence. Buckminster Fuller, famous, famous futurist, he said, we are to be architects of the future not its victims. And this is why I think it's important for us to be architects of our own humanity. So thanks for your time, and have a nice day. I'll see you in the future. Thank you.